Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Be seated, please. Let us join together in the call to worship, saying, I was glad when they said unto me, Let us go into the house of the Lord. God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not counting their sins against them, and has commissioned us with a message of reconciliation. Let us join together in confessing our sins before God, saying, Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. And for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy upon us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. Hear now the good news of the gospel. The saying is completely reliable and should be universally accepted that Christ Jesus entered the world to rescue sinners. He personally bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might be dead to sin and alive to all that is good. Now who is in a position to condemn? Only Christ, and Christ died for us, rose for us, reigns in power for us, and prays for us. If anyone is in Christ, that person becomes a new person altogether. The past is finished and gone. Everything has become fresh and new. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Oh Lord, open my lips. Who has safely brought us to the beginning of this day. Defend us in the same with thy mighty power, and grant that this day we fall into no sin, neither run into any kind of danger, but that all our doings being ordered by thy governance may be righteous in thy sight. We thank you that you have brought us again from the parishes of our lives and into your house to be with you again and to experience the love and the glorious fellowship of your children. Help us through the reading of the scripture, the preaching of the word, the songs of praise and thanksgiving, and the prayers which we raise unto you, that having entered to pray, we may depart to serve in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.
Lord be with you. Let us pray. Father, we pray for your universal church and for God's people throughout the world and for our own united evangelical church that we may be filled with your Holy Spirit and that through the power of your Son, Jesus, we all may be one. We pray for all ministers, priests, and apostles that they may be faithful ministers of your word and sacraments and with joy and thanksgiving go forth to tell the great things that you have done for us all. Now in the quiet of this hour, we bring to you our prayers and petitions with the certainty that you will grant whatever we ask in your name. We leave each of our burdens at the foot of your cross, knowing that only you are strong enough to carry them. And so we pause now for a moment of silent prayer as we bring our concerns and our petitions to you, our Father. Hear now the prayers of your servants, that each of us may go home from this hour of worship, rejoicing in your victory over any trouble or distress which may befall us. We pray for all who govern and hold authority in the nations of the world, and especially for the President of the United States. Guide him in these moments of peril and lead him in the fight for justice and for peace. Lord, we remember the words of your son Jesus, who said, whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my mother and sister and brother. And today, in the presence of this, our spiritual family, we have lighted this unity candle today. Thanks to our Heavenly Father for consecrating the union um, of the parents, grandparents, great-grandparents of Lou and Isabel Parker in the name and by the power of the Holy Spirit and for including them uh, as brothers and sisters in the larger family of the household of faith by the work of your Holy Spirit. Now we remember the words of the prophet Isaiah who said, they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks, and that nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. Work through the leaders of the world that one day your children will live together in peace. Have compassion now upon all of those in this parish who suffer from any grief or trouble that they may be delivered from their distress and find a happy issue out of every affliction. Now, Lord, we remember the healing of your saints, remembering George Finnerty, and opening ourselves up to uh, praying for Dolly Earl and, and thanking you for your blessings of healing for Emma and Marie Malco and Ernest Miller, John Wish and Mary Matusik. Be with Margaret Fitzberger now, and John Kolaszewski, and Doris Kalin, and Ann Burns, and Roberta, Don Cook, and Shelley Craig, and Ann Schwartz, and Mary H., and Bobby, and Judy, and Terry, and Ed, and Beth, and John, and Brian, and Chris, and Joe, and Donna, and Pat Haggerty, Joe Frank, and Fred, and Edna and Charles, and Karen and Ryan and Francis, and Dorothy and Margie Myrick, and Pam and Katrina and Ann 
Baby Mike, Elizabeth, and Bill, Lou, Jr., Dan, Virginia, uh, Dolly Earl, Sissy Rout, Lillian Haas, Joyce Notella, Ellen Smith, Irma and Sarah Plakowski, Elsie, Ketchum, Millie and Jim, Bernadetta Strasner, Ms. Sorda, Marie Kaufman, Pastor and Priscilla, Charlie C. and Bill F., Carrie F., Michelle, Lori, Josephine, Charlie, and all our chemotherapy patients, the friends of Lois and Art, Margaret, Pam, and Katrina, Darla, Walsh, and Peggy. Surround these now with the white healing light of your spirit that they may claim the health, the wholeness, and the abundant life which you promise to all of your children. Now we praise God for those in every generation in whom Christ has been honored by a lively faith, and especially for Alberta Bowersfeld, who is now living in the eternal life, whom we raise up in honor today and for the support all during the years of closing years of her life, especially that Paul Bowersfeld gave uh, as a truly uh, anointed saint of this church. Strengthen these two people that his faith and hers may continue to be the light of the world. We pray, too, that we have the grace to glorify Christ, each one in our own day, in our own way. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen.
Sorry about that. I've been uh, having some trouble with my chemotherapy, I guess, and it uh, caught up with me. Anyhow, good morning. I'm so happy to be here with you and to celebrate on this warm uh, July or, or June uh, date uh, to celebrate the commitment of our church to the Lord Jesus Christ, the center of all of our work and all of our being. We have had a very interesting time um, at this time, and we want to note the celebration of the, uh, of the gift of the Parkers uh, uh, for the Unity Candle today, remembering uh, the parents, grandparents, and great-grandparents, which we sometimes miss because all of us have these people, and they play an integral part in our lives, and it's uh, wonderful to be able to say thanks, especially if you're a grandparent. You, you really like to have your kids say thanks. I'm sure that they appreciate it. <clears throat> we also, uh, of course, remembering uh, Alberta Bowersfeld, who was a great church leader here and uh, gave much of her time to the Sunday School along with Paul. And they did a great job together, and Paul is still living as uh, one of the saints. You see, in our church, a saint is not a perfect person. In our church, a saint is a person who follows Christ. So. So I can say to you, you're all saints. Everybody is a saint uh, in the Protestant tradition. <clears throat> now, uh, I think there, there's one other thing that I need to deal with, and, and, and I can't de deal with it now because the paper's up on the altar, but uh, I, I will do that right before the sermon, so uh, you'll uh, get the message. Oh, one of the things is, we're, you know, we're running this raffle. This raffle provides $2,400 in income to the church. Uh, if we can sell f 50 more tickets, we'll be able to return the $2,400 to the church immediately, and then we'll run off the raffle. But otherwise, uh, th we'll lose the money, and we'll have to refund it to everybody. So anybody who can buy some raffle tickets, that would be great. You can get in touch with the office and, and, and do that. Well, I think that that concludes the uh, announcements. <clears throat> uh, I'm just to say for myself that I, I've been going through this chemotherapy, and, and so I, I went through a fever time, and I went through a time of diarrhea <laughs> and so forth, and I now am going through a time of immense uh, personal fatigue, which is part of the, the story of those who go through chemotherapy. That's why when I think about praying for all those years, for Shirley Keller, who fought cancer for five years here. I'm praying for Art and Lois and, and Shirley Keller, who taught us all something about the meaning of chemotherapy in, the, in that five years. She died of every kind of cancer practically you could come up with. So anyhow, the thing is that uh, that gives you hope and that's how we need to be able to help one another to show what needs to be done and how to support one another as we go through these various kinds of things that happen to us when we're 39 and a half. Are there any other announcements to be made today? If not so, then let us return to the Lord a portion of that which we have received from him, remembering that he is, gives us every good gift, including the life which we share together.
thou Christ who didst reveal thyself to Mary and to Peter and to the twelve and then to the many faithful witnesses, reveal thyself to us as well through the many and varied ways of life wherein all things we can see and understand these mysteries of life have been revealed through the power of the Spirit. And that Spirit has led us to come into this house to say, Our God, accept this our offering. In Jesus' name, Amen. I was too hasty in asking you to be seated because the tradition is that always in a reading of the gospel, not Old Testament lessons, nor the letters of St. Paul, but rather with the gospel, we always stand. So I ask you now, please, to do so. In the gospel of St. Luke, we read in the 10th chapter, verses 25 to 37. A lawyer stood up to test Jesus and he said, teacher, what must I do? to inherit eternal life. And Jesus said to him, well, what is written in the law? What do you read there? He answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said, you have gotten the right answer. Do this and you will live. But wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, but who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. He fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. By chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, he passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, while traveling, came near him, and when he saw him, he was moved with pity, and he went and bandaged his wound, wounds, having poured oil on wine on them, and then he put him on his own animal, and he brought him to an inn and took care of him. The next day, he took out two denarii, and he gave them to the innkeeper, and he said, take care of this man. When I come back, I will repay you whatever you spent. Which of the three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? He said, the one who showed him mercy. Jesus said to him, go and do thou likewise. The word of the Lord.
You may be seated. I just want to again express my appreciation to Roy Jolenbeck, my parish assistant here, uh, who uh, I called last night at 9 o'clock and said, Roy, can you be there? Because I was a little shaky. And I guess I still am a little bit. Anyhow, he was there. And uh, if something happened to me, Roy would have picked up and carried the service for you, and I know that you would have enjoyed it. Next week, he's going to preach uh, at the 4th of July communion service. What a wonderful combination of the birth of this country and the birth of, uh, of, the, of the Christian faith. <clears throat> Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be always acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Now, last Sunday, we talked about the, the uh, uh, loss of all those men, 10,000 people murdered by Milosevic in, in uh, Serbia and in Kosovo, uh, men who died with hopes and dreams that they were never able to achieve. And so today, I'd like to focus on our own country. Uh, what are we doing here? Uh, and, and focus on especially the dream of the Christian America. You see, America has always had uh, a, a, a dream. Uh, the vision was carried to our country by those who settled it, by the pilgrims, if you will, our forebears in the faith, who established a colony in, in Massachusetts, the Massachusetts Bay Colony. Led, the, uh, they were led, just led to the need to separate church, uh, religion, and the government, and to the separation of church and state. So we sing together, open my eyes that I may see glimpses of truth thou hast for me. Now this principle of separation of church and state was written into our Constitution and was made a matter of law. However important that principle was, over the years the dream of the Christian America persists. In contrast to the intellectual separation of church and state and law, this dream was a matter of the heart. The dream of a Christian America was involved in the debate of such issues such as slavery and resulted in the most destructive war in our history. No man, it was said, could find his fulfillment in a land that was half slave and half free. Yes, and we're still fighting that battle through. We, we haven't com completely cleaned it up. Yes, there were other issues fought out in our country, such as how we treated people during the Industrial Revolution in the late 1800s, where we used children to work in the factories and paid them and their mothers and fathers sweatshop labor wages. Uh, this is still being done in, to the undocumented aliens in the sweatshops of our own New York City and on the farms of migrant workers who pick crops, and while issues such as slavery and the exploitation of labor in the Industrial Revolution were attacked for economic reasons, there, were always, there was always the dream there of a Christian America in this drive for change and for making America a kinder, gentler nation. Place in my hands we sing the wonderful key that shall unclasp and set me free. See, the Christian faith is revolutionary, actually. And now we are fighting a new battle against urban violence, and this violence is powered by an economy built on meism and getting what I deserve at any cost. We are living in a world which has taught young people to get theirs in any way they can, that helping your brother is a fool's game. Being a good Samaritan is a fool's game, you see, uh, which you can never win. It has been an economy that is based on cynicism and despair and survival of the fittest. We are living in a world where the once re respected bankers and real estate brokers have stolen billions of dollars, billions of dollars from the taxpayers and, and from their clients while getting what they deserve uh, at the expense of those that they are supposed to serve. This philosophy has been applauded by business and governmental leaders. No wonder that a 12-year-old drug seller who can make $150 a day instead of uh, the minimum wage, is intrigued with the possibilities when he sees his brothers and sisters, his mother and father, in struggling in poverty and trying to make a living on the minimum wage. We have watched corporations move production units to Mexico, Taiwan, and South America in order to take advantage of their, the tax situations there 
the lack of environmental controls and the low wages, all in order to get theirs with no thought for jobs for American workers. And there are families <coughs> whose factories have been dis dismantled. They do this to get that big house, that boat, that condo in the islands, that BMW, and they even verbalize it as making a killing, a killing, that's an important word there. Why should the intelligent kid not get into this lucrative drug market and get what he deserves, like uh, big high top shoes for 150 bucks, a car, nice clothing, all you can eat and drink, and all the drugs you want, uh, and all the liquor. Now in the middle of all this, uh, we find that young people want to speed up getting theirs. They no longer ask for it when they have drug people who owe them money. They simply take out a gun and if you don't have the money, they shoot you in the face. And if they can't get you in the face, they'll shoot you in the back so as to sever your spine forever. Later, you see, uh, they shoot first and get their respect or money or gold change or whatever else they want. Now later, however, <clears throat> even if they wanted minimum wage jobs, can they get them? 25% of blacks have no jobs, black males. 25% of black males are in jail or on probation. Think about how difficult it is to get a job today, even for those who, where race is not the obstacle. And then look again at the reason why some of these persons uh, may not have jobs. Silently, silently says the hymn, now I wait for thee, ready my God thy will to see. Now let me illustrate what is happening in our neighborhood as we see the evils of violence working around us. The lives of the victims will never be quite the same. My name is Lillian Sowers. It was June 1992. I was coming home from East Point. I was carrying a purse and a little bag with a suit for my little granddaughter. And when I got off the bus, I noticed that the street was empty. I walked toward my home, and when I was two houses away, a man jumped out of the bushes and grabbed my pocketbook. I screamed, help me, help me. God, won't you help me? And he turned me around, and I was very upset and confused and tried to hold on to my purse. A neighbor came out, that, uh, his, uh, out of his house. He saw the man, and he began to chase him. A second neighbor joined him, and the robber ran down an alley. My neighbors followed him, and in the meantime, another neighbor, a woman, called the police who responded almost immediately. Three police came uh, along with a paddy wagon. This neighbor who called the police followed the man and saw the strap of my purse from underneath a, a, discharge, a discarded sofa in the alley. She brought it to me. I was very frightened and upset. Meanwhile, the man followed, uh, the men followed the robber uh, over by the key hospital, and when the police drove, they pointed out this robber, and he was arrested. The neighbors who called the police came to court with me and supported me. Another neighbor came, too. In court, I could not identify the man. He was white. They had him fixed up and changed his hair so you could not recognize him when he appeared in the lineup. At least I got my pocketbook back, and the judge said she would have to set him free because I could not identify him. But thanks to my neighbors, I got my pocketbook back, and through all this, they were there for me. I never had such good neighbors. I am 89 years old. And now we hear a story which appeared in the uh, recent uh, uh, issue of The Sun, the story about George Dangerfield, who was convicted in federal court this week on the 20th of, uh, of uh, uh, June uh, for conspiracy to sell and distribute drugs. Uh, the report occurred in the, uh, it was a large story in the, in the Sun papers. You see, he was, at 29, a person who built 
an empire of 22 corporations and was operating 125 to 150 slum houses, slum houses, houses that he bought from white uh, uh, slum owners who gave up in that uh, area of the city and sold it to the first person who would take them, and George was right there ready to take the, the houses. And so it was then, by a system he used, he took his uh, cocaine profits and his drug profits and plowed the money to capitalize the, uh, uh, the acquisition of all these slum houses. And then he ran them with a tight fist so that he, uh, if anybody complained, they had to face his goons, and, and they wandered around, and George began to feel more and more like he was absolutely impossible to stop. As a matter of fact, what he did was, uh, he was very ostentatious. He had a, a, a limousines, he had a, a Humvee, a, a Lincoln Town Car, a Naughty, and a blue Rolls Royce, one of the, one of the few Rolls Royces in the Baltimore area. In the city courts, he beat seven indictments for drug dealing and distribution, and for at least 10 years, uh, uh, he uh, escaped convictions. He had a, 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 a think tank of uh, attorneys bigger than a small law firm to defend him, and he thought that no one could stop him. He would run our town. He called himself K.O.B., the king of Baltimore, and aspired to become the mayor of Baltimore. How would you like to have him for mayor? Well, George used goons to control his empire of slum houses and had a long record also of scoff laws in terms of dealing with violations, housing violations. Uh, in, the, uh, in the course of his life, uh, uh, he proved to be a very a charming, voluble, or he spoke well uh, uh, as a person. He was a handsome, athletic person. He was charming. He was raised in the suburbs. He was not a kid from, he said, I, I came up from the hoods. No, he didn't come up from the hoods. He came from the suburbs of uh, Baltimore. He came from a family where his mother was an assistant uh, auditor for the state, and his father was a postal uh, employee. Uh, and he was a, an, uh, an adamant church member. He attended church, and in fact, he, he had also attended the Police Athletic League and other youth groups that he was uh, interested in. Well, he was represented in court by his pastor and was the recipient recently of an award and for outstanding community service given to him by his church. Oh, it makes me shiver. This time, however, he was caught with a half pound of bag of cocaine, and he was charged in the federal courts and convicted. Uh, the jury was made up of his peers, and when you think of the damage that he has done to our city and all those who are hurt through his selling of drugs, and for the 10-year period that they, it took 10, year, 10 years for people to identify this man who was obviously a star in the, in the real estate area and to decide that we've we got to take him down, man. And there was one man who came along and who said, I'm going to do it, and he did it. Uh, now, <clears throat> George uh, 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 gave the law enforcement people something to celebrate this week. And he went immediately to the detention center, where at least he's now experiencing some bars and barbed wire, and he is confined to that center for three months before they finally give him his sentence. But the sentence for conspiracy uh, and distribution to sell drugs is 10 years in jail, and that's the minimum. And then George may be there for an eternity if, if somebody does justice. Well, you see, uh, he faces that mandatory sentence in the federal law. Now, for 10 years, no one had the strength to stop him in the city courts. But now, the end is coming for George. Open my eyes that I may see visions of 
which, which are there for me. Now, as we see the stories of violence and theft, some of us can only uh, see decay, hopelessness, and despair in our future. We can take the position that nothing can be done if we look at only at the negatives. When we have lost hope, however, our church, our neighborhood, and our city, and ourselves, and our nation has no future. Look for a moment, rather, at the hope in the neighbors who risk their lives to help little sours uh, and who cared uh, for other people in our church who've been in similar situations. There is a resident in our community of love, responsibility, integrity, and caring. These are a part of the dream of Christian America. We Americans are not content to let tragedy have the last word. We act to alter the circumstances uh, that produce that. We Christians can achieve a better world and I'll reclaim America again. So open my eyes that I may hear voices of truth thou sendest clear. We have to believe that the dream of Christian America is not dead. We have to believe in building a society where caring is shown not only by our leaders but by each one of us. We have to find a way to put people to work and to concentrate on investment and growth. Just look at the infrastructures of our cities and we know that we need to rebuild all our public transportation system, roads, bridges, healthcare system, and even protect social security. Look at our need to build housing for the homeless and to retrain defense workers and to retrain those who have, who have um, uh, been involved in all of the diversification that's taken place and who do not have the technical skills to keep up and to beef the police protection in our neighborhoods. We want to lock people up, you see, and throw away the key, but we do not want to fund the expensive cost of a prison system. We recognize the need for treatment for drug addicts, but we have cut the money for these programs. We have made it impossible for our people to buy homes and to become homeowners. And when we have, when the wave notes fall on my ear, everything else we sang will disappear. In the Christian faith, everything is possible. All good things are possible. And we ultimately are on the side of, of, of righteousness and, and of peace. Now, if we are to revitalize America now, we Christians need to find into, uh, again, a new relationship with God. If we are to witness again the, the importance of faith in our lives and work uh, uh, to impact this city, we need to tell again the story of the Good Samaritan and in our personal lives to make that story come alive. You remember the Lord who asked Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Well, remember, it was Jesus who asked him what, what, what is written in the law. And the lawyer said, love your neighbor as your, love the Lord your God and your neighbor as yourself. And then we heard Jesus say, you have given the right answer. You are, uh, as, see, as most of us are, people who know what the answer is, but we do not want to do it. So Jesus said, do this, do this, and you will live. And then emerged the $64 question, and who is my neighbor? Yes, that lawyer knew that it was the Good Samaritan, and Jesus who said, go and do likewise. Open my eyes, illumine me, spirit divine. Amen. Let us join now in saying what we believe. Let us now confess our sin, our, make our confession together. This is the good news which we receive, in which we stand, and by which we are saved, that Christ died for our sins according to the scripture, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day, that he appeared first to Mary and to Peter, and then to the twelve and to all faithful witnesses. We believe he is the Christ, the Son of the living God, 
He is the first and the last, the beginning and the end. He is our Lord and our God. Amen. You may be seated. Let us pray. We thank you, Father, for the gift of faith in Jesus Christ, our Lord, and especially for the service to this church as shown in the work of Paul and Alberta Bowersfeld, and the work of all those grandparents, great-grandparents, and grandchildren of Isabel uh, and Lou Parker, for their work, which has been such a blessing to their community of faith and to our community of faith. And now we remember those who have gone before us in the faith and who live eternally with thee. Remembering especially today those in whose name memorials have been given today and for whom love gifts have been presented. As we say, thank you, Lord, for your consideration and reception into the eternal life of Alberta Bowersfeld. Calvin Gunlock, and Charles Sonny Waters. Oh, as we say, O oh God, before whom the generations rise and pass away, we praise you for all your servants who, having lived life in faith, and now live eternally with you. And especially do we thank you for your servants whom we have named, for the gift of their lives, the grace that you have given them, and for all that in them was good and kind and faithful. We thank you that for them death is past and pain is ended and they have entered the joy that you have prepared through Jesus Christ our Lord, who taught us when we gather together to pray, say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. But deliver us kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift the light of his countenance upon you and give you God's peace. And now peace I leave with you, my friends, peace that the world cannot give. Peace I leave with you, my friends, so that your joy may be forever full. Be strong now and be of good courage. Fight the good fight, finish the race, and keep the faith. And may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you now and forever.